Good morning, Brian Beckley here again, and welcome back. Our second episode, exploring original uh, original source documentation. In our previous episode, we looked at the instructions given by way of advice, basically the marching orders for uh, how the colonists uh, were to conduct themselves once they first uh, arrived in Virginia, and specifically. We looked at their instructions for how to choose a place to settle and explored, you know, why they ended up on Jamestown Island, even though from a modern perspective, it often it often looks like not the best choice. But there's a lot more in this document about what they should be doing once they've chosen a spot uh, and how to proceed after that. So that's what we're going to delve into today. So first we're going to look at kind of division of labor. And they say, when you have discovered as far up the river as you mean to plant yourselves and landed your victuals and munitions to the end that every man may know his charge, you shall do well to divide your six score men into three parts. Now, six score men, the numbers here are, don't necessarily exactly match some of the other documentation. You know, for instance, we know they left, they left England with 105 colonists. Uh, they lose one Edward Brooks on the way over on the Isle of Mona as their island hopping through the Caribbean. So they arrive here with 104 colonists. There's probably somewhere around 40 sailors between the three ships. And we know that uh, those, those ships are here for about six weeks before the, the two larger vessels, Susan Constant and Godspeed, head back to England. So we presume the sailors are helping with a lot of this initially, uh, but including the sailors, it's more than six score. Without the sailors, it's fewer than six score. So this, this document may have actually been written ahead of time before they actually completely finalized their recruiting process with the plan of bringing uh, 120 men with them. Uh, but this still gives us the, some insight into their basic plan for what they need to be doing when they first get here. So they say, you shall do well to divide your six score men into three parts, where of 140 of them you may appoint to fortify and build, of which your first word must be your storehouse for victual. So this makes sense. You've put a lot of, of, of painstaking effort into getting provisions, not just for the voyage, but for the first several months worth of survival in Virginia all the way from England to Virginia in an edible state. So many different foodstuffs to sustain these guys. The last thing you want to do is leave it all out in the weather. You got to get it off the ship. The ships need to get back to England. So first thing you need to build is a storehouse where you can put your provisions and protect them. Not just from the elements either. If you want to be careful, make sure this stuff lasts. You need to be able to control it. You need to be able to ration it, which means you kind of need to be able to keep under lock and key. Um, so storehouse for victual needs to be the first thing you build. 30 others you may employ in preparing your ground and sowing your corn and roots. And, uh, and you know, so basically they're talking, get farming going. And it's actually one of the big reasons they left England when they did. They, they leave England uh, December 20th. It's a really not great time of year to be trying to sail in the waters that are immediately around England and they get stuck in the English Channel in foul weather for the better part of five weeks because of it but they made that call as their goal was to arrive here in time for planting season get off the ships put seeds in the ground you know so again uh, you know this touches on another another common misconception that they brought a bunch of people who didn't know what they were doing that they brought people that didn't know how to farm and, and that sort of thing well Clearly, they're coming, they, they, they built their whole schedule around getting here in time to plant the instant they got off the ships. Um, it also helps in avoiding hurricane season and that sort of thing, but that's one of the biggest goals for arriving that time of year. So clearly, they brought some folks that know how to do that. Plus, the archaeology has turned up plow furrows that are very clearly from those first couple of years. Uh, so we know they're doing, at least attempting farming right off the bat. Um, so they're saying 30. Uh, then you must employ in, in, in getting that going, preparing the ground, 
clearing trees, plowing, and planting. Uh, and remember, they're, they're trying to break six score men into thirds here. So you've got a, a chunk of 40 men building, and now a chunk of 30 men planting, and the other 10 removed from that group of 30, they say, the other 10 of these 40 you must leave as sentinel at the haven's mouth. They've already touched on another part in this document, the fact that as soon as they choose a river, before the, the river they're going to go up, but before they head up that river, you need to leave lookouts to watch your back, basically. Leave 10 men with a boat down at the mouth of the river, just in case the Spanish, they, they convinced, again, the Spanish, as we discussed last time, they're convinced the Spanish are going to come get them at some point, sooner or later. Just in case it's sooner, just in case the Spanish are actually chasing you across the ocean, leave lookouts at the mouth of the river. Leave those guys in the boat so they can come warn you. So 10 of your men are already down overlooking the bay, keeping an eye out for any potential um, Spanish or any, any other European power. Spain's the main concern, but anybody else come to get you. So 40 men are building. 30 men are farming, 10 are down keeping an eye out the haven's mouth. The other 40 you may employ for two months in discovery of the river about you. So in, in discovering the exploration of the river about you. Um, and on the, on, it says on the contrary, on the country about you, uh, which charge Captain Newport and Captain Gosnold may undertake of these 40 discoverers. Uh, so... Captain Newport, who captained the Susan Constant and commanded the fleet on the way over. Captain Gosnold, Bartholomew Gosnold, who's kind of the original idea man behind the entirety of this expedition. It's, 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 uh, it's kind of his, the, his brainchild, this whole expedition. He captains the Godspeed on the way over, and now he's going to be helping lead this, this first exploration. As soon as you get here, inland, upriver, see what you can find right off the bat. You've got a lot you've got to do all at once. And um, let's see, they go on to say when they do espy any high lands or hills, Captain Gosnold may take 20, so half of the guys that have been devoted to exploration, 20 of the company to cross over the lands and carrying half a dozen pickaxes to try if they can find any mineral. Of course, this is why the Virginia Company is here. They're not coming here just to find some interesting new place for Englishmen to live. They are here specifically trying to make money, and what better way to make money than to find gold, silver, that sort of thing, and find the stuff your money's made out of. And that's a, a really top goal for the Virginia Company. The, uh, so they're, they're saying, you, Gosnold, if you see high ground, Gosnold can take half that exploration expedition with picks, with pickaxes, ex, ex, uh, excavation tools, and go see if they can find any valuable mineral. The other 20 may go on by river and pitch up bows upon the bank side by which the other boats shall follow them by the same turnings. Um, so basically kind of leaving a trail of breadcrumbs so that everybody else knows where you've gone. So in case you disappear in the interior of this continent, they can figure out where you've ended up. You may also take with them a wherry, uh, such as used here in the Thames, uh, so basically, a, 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 again, a, a boat so the, small enough that could be transported aboard these ships. So you've got more than one type of transportation available as soon as you get here. Uh, by which you may send back to the president for supply of munition or any other want that you may not be driven to return for every small defect. Uh, president, of course, they're initially under a seven-man council to elect amongst themselves a president. First president being Edward Mariah Wingfield. Uh, but basically, they're saying... Take a smaller boat with you so that if you start to run low on provisions or equipment or what have you, the whole expedition doesn't have to come back. Send a couple of guys back in the boat to get more provisions. Make the most efficient use of your time possible. These are all things, again, that these guys are contemplating before they've even left England. Again, pretty well, pretty well thought out. Uh, they say, you must observe, if you can, whether the river on which you plant doth spring out of mountains or out of lakes. If it be out of a lake, the passage to the other sea will be the more easy. Again, big goal for the Virginia Company. They're hoping to find a Northwest Passage. And as we discussed last time, that often sounds like a laughable concept from a modern perspective, but there's only one way for these folks to find out if any of these waterways go anywhere, and that's to go and have a look. But again, they're being pretty uh, common sense uh, and pretty realistic about it. Where does that river come from? If it's coming out of the mountains, you're probably out of luck. But if it's coming out of an inland body of water, 
there's a chance that you might be able to find a river back out the other side that heads towards another major body of water like the other ocean you're trying to get here. And they go on to say just that. It is like enough that out of the same lake you shall find some spring which run the contrary way toward the East India Sea. And then they go on to cite geographical example that they already have experience with. So again, these guys are not basing all of this on pure hopes and dreams. They're drawing on real world experience, things that they've observed other places in the world. This is a geographical possibility. They use the example, um, uh, they use the example here, the famous river of Volga, Tanais, which is a, a reference to an ancient Greek city that is along a, a neighboring river to the river Volga. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the river of Volga, Tanais, and Dwina uh, have three heads near joined, yet the one falleth into the Caspian Sea, the other into the Euxine Sea, or the Black Sea, and the third into the Polonian Sea, the Baltic Sea. So, great example. You're getting basically crossing whole continents in, in, in Central and Eastern Europe by, again, interior waterways connecting all of these exterior bodies of water. Um, so again, they're drawing on previous experience, not just basing this on their, their hopes and dreams. Uh, <clears throat> they've also, as we touched on in our last episode, got some fairly realistic expectations when it comes to interacting with the native population, with the Powhatan. They say, in all your passages, you must have great care not to offend the naturals, if you can eschew it, and employ some few of your company to trade with them. Uh, and they say specifically to trade for corn and all other lasting victuals, if they have it. And this you must do before they perceive you man mean to plant among them. Really good common sense there. If they know you're moving in, planning to stay, they may not be real enthused about selling you food and making it easier for you to survive here. But I think they think you're just visiting and leaving again. They may be more than happy to resupply you and get you on your way. So they're saying buy as much food as you can from the natives if they've got any available to sell as soon as you get there, before they really know what you're doing. So again, pretty realistic expectation here. Um, and they go on to say, uh, for being not sure how your own seed corn will prosper the first year, to avoid the danger of famine, use an endeavor to store yourselves of the country corn. Again, very realistic expectation. They're not coming here expecting immediate success in everything they try. They know they've never farmed in Virginia before. They know they may not be successful right off the bat. So they're saying, try to, to secure yourself as much surplus as possible as soon as you get there in case your crops do fail. So you've got a cushion to fall back on. So again, very solid plan very realistic expectations. The, um, the document, they then go on again to talk about their interactions with the natives. They say your discoverers, your explorers, that pass over land with hired guides, which is pretty common practice pretty much anywhere you go. You want to find where things are, talk some of the locals into helping you explore. Um, those uh, discoverers that pass over land with hired guides must look well to them that they slip not from them. And for the more assurance, let them take a compass with them and write down how far they go upon every point of the compass. For that country having no way nor path, if that your guides run from you in the great woods or deserts, you shall hardly ever find a passage back. So again, pretty common sense move. Don't hire local guides. Let them lead you in the middle of nowhere and abandon you to your fate. Try to make sure that they don't slip you, and just in case, take notes on how far you've gone in each direction on the compass point, um, so that if they do abandon you, hopefully you can find your way back. Um, now this also ties into that, uh, that hope of, of Gosnell going over land and trying to find mineral on high ground. They're actually successful. Gosnell and his half of the expedition, they explore inland, and they find a rock that they believe has got silver in it, uh, silver bearing strata there, and they try to extract it. And they bend and, and break their, their pickaxes, they damage their tools. Um, and we don't know, I like to think that some purchaser from the Virginia company just didn't understand the difference between uh, a miner's pick and a farmer's pick and kind of cheaped out on them. We don't know if that's the case or not, but whatever the case is, 
their equipment isn't up to the task. They end up ultimately having to return to James Fort with everything else going on in the colony. Those, the men on that expedition are never able to go back and try to find the spot. But because they did as they, they followed by those instructions, they made notes. They made notes on how far they went on each point of the compass. And so quite a while later, another group of men tried to follow those notes and find the spot with better equipment and extract that silver. But you think about it, you're wandering off into what is for you uncharted wilderness with a blank piece of paper trying to make a map as you go. How accurate is the first pass going to be? Turns out not quite accurate enough. They're never able to find that, that silver load again. Um, now they go on to say, again, using native guides to help you explore, they say, how, and how weary soever your soldiers be, let them never trust the country people with the carriage of their weapons. For if they run from you with your shot, referring to firearms in general, which they only fear, they will easily kill them all with their arrows. They're, again, making a, a point here. The only thing that's going to concern the natives, the only thing that natives are going to be afraid of that you've got are your firearms. They already know there's not a whole lot else that they're necessarily going to be super impressed by or in awe of the firearms are key. So even if you guys are tired and they're tired of carrying their musket around, don't let one of your hired native guides carry it for you because they might run off with it. Now, you don't have it, and you've taken that that one advantage that you had away. They uh, really want these guys to emphasize that advantage. And so the passage continues, and whensoever any of yours shoots before them, be sure that they be chosen out of your best marksmen. For if they see your learners miss what they aim at, they will think the weapon not so terrible, and thereby will be bold to assault you. A little bit of um, kind of psychological warfare there. Makes perfect sense. You don't want... Um, a people that you're trying to get along with but may not always be at peace with, you don't want them to watch your trainings. You don't want to watch them see any of the potential downsides or failings to the weapon. You want only your most expert musketeers, your most expert marksmen demonstrating these weapons to try to overemphasize how effective and impressive these weapons are, to try to keep the natives as in awe of that weapon as possible. Makes perfect sense. <clears throat> they then go on to say, Above all things, do not advertise the killing of any of your men that the country people may know of it. If they perceive they are but common men, and that with the loss of many of theirs they may diminish any part of yours, they will make many adventures upon you. Not as realistic an expectation there. 400 years of hindsight tells us that the natives are not willing to engage in the kind of warfare that's going to cost them tons of lives. They tend to be pretty cautious about entering uh, that kind of conflict. But the English don't have any experience with them yet, so they don't know, but it makes sense. Try to hide any of your vulnerabilities. Don't advertise any of your vulnerabilities to the natives. Again, you're going to try to be getting along with them, but it, it's not going to last forever. Um, you know, again, as, as they discussed that in an earlier pa passage, they're expecting eventually the natives are going to get tired of them. Um, so try to maintain this mystique of being more than a regular human. Um, they, uh, they continue that thought uh, by saying, if the country uh, be populous, you shall do well also not to let them see or know of your sick men, if you have any, which also may encourage them to many enterprises. Um, so you know, not only don't advertise if any of your men die, Try not to ever show them that any of your men getting sick. You know, really, again, try to, to overemphasize that um, you are in, in some way superior because uh, you're at a lot of disadvantages if it comes to warfare with the natives. So you want to try to have some kind of psychological impact ready there. Um, they're taking a lot of precautions for security, as we discussed in the, uh, in the, in the first episode. They're concerned... To a certain extent, with conflict with the natives, but really concerned about Spain coming to get them. They're also concerned to a certain extent with internal security. Um, they, of the three ships they bring with them, Susan Constant and Godspeed are hired and are going to be headed back to England. Discovery is purchased to keep here, the smallest vessel purchased to keep here, used to explore the rivers, to use, to use, you move trade goods around, that sort of thing. Um, and so they say, uh, you must. Uh, you must take order to draw up the pinnace, which is the type of, of ship that Discovery is. 
uh, that is left with you under your fort and take her sails and anchors ashore, all but a small kedge to ride by, lest some ill-disposed persons slip away with her. Again, realistic expectations here. They're not expecting it to be sunshine and daisies when they get here. They're anticipating enough unpleasantness that somebody might get upset enough, frustrated enough, discouraged enough that they might try to steal the discovery and sail back to England or go on and do their own thing. So they're saying basically remove everything from that ship that can be used to make it go. Take the majority of its anchors, uh, take all of its sails and everything um, so that it cannot be used by any unauthorized personnel. Um, the, uh, you know, they're, they're also talking about sort of, again, more of an internal security issue when you've got ships coming in. The sailors that are, that are operating those ships are not, in most cases, directly employed by the Virginia Company. They're contractors. It'd be like today if you rented a U-Haul truck and it came with its own driver. Um, these folks do not work directly for the Virginia Company. And while they've been hired by the company to move their people and cargo, it's pretty common practice at the time for these merchant sailors, when they make other ports, to try to do stuff on the side while they're there to make a bit of money for themselves. So do business in another port or in a place like this without an established um, you know, sort of European economy uh, to try to do some trade, try to bring some, some trade items back that they can make some personal gain on. That's normal practice at the time. But of course, the Virginia company is here to make money and one of their veins for making money is trade with the natives. They don't want the sailors to mess that up. And so they, uh, they go to say, you must take care that your mariners that go for wages do not mar your trade. For those that mind not to inhabit, for a little gain will debase the estimation of exchange and hinder the trade forever after. And therefore you shall not admit or suffer any person whatsoever, other than such as shall be appointed by the president and council there to buy any merchandises or any things whatsoever. This is, again, pretty, pretty common sense stuff, but uh, what ends up happening is exactly that. Almost all of their trade, uh, major lucrative trade items with the natives early on, blue glass beads, copper, you know, this sort of thing, um, the sailors end up helping to flood the market and really drop the bottom out of, of the value of those uh, trade items. They also, of course, have major prohibition on the sale of any kind of, of military equipment to the natives. Um, and try to restrict the sale of, of iron tools and that sort of thing to the natives as well. Uh, to a controllable level, and there seems to be plenty of evidence for the sailors selling what is essentially contraband uh, uh, goods to the natives, whether it be munitions or weapons or tools or what have you, and that's exactly what they're saying. The sailors aren't staying here. What do they care about the long-term ramifications? They're trying to make a bit of money for themselves, uh, and it ends up hurting the trade for the colony in the long run and potentially causing security concerns. You certainly don't want firearms or munitions, again, getting into the, the hands of a potential enemy. Um, so there's, you know, there's, there's a concern there that ends up coming true is there's not but so much they can do to control folks that don't work directly for them. Um, they go on talking about, uh, again, division of labor. They're talking about the tradesmen, the carpenters and other such like workmen. They need to work first towards the common good. Build buildings that are going to function for everyone before things that only serve a few or private individuals. Even talking about what is pretty commonplace at the time, some of the higher ranking men ha may have people with them that are in their personal employ, not working for the Virginia Company directly. And they say even these people should do work for the common good first, then work uh, on, on private projects. Um, they're talking about, you know, once you've got everything laid out, once you've built the fort, how you should order your houses and everything, that you should send, uh, as they say, you shall do well to send a perfect relation by Captain Newport of all that is done, of what height you are seated, how far into the land, what commodities you find, what soil, woods, and their several kinds, and so of all other things else to advertise particularly. Um, basically, when Newport comes back with those ships, Send us a thorough relation, a thorough account of everything you've found. Uh, and again, on a note of, to a certain extent, some internal security, um, they go on to say to suffer no man to return, but by passport from the president and council, nor to write any letter of anything that may discourage others. Again, realistic expectation. Not expecting it to be sunshine and daisies. They don't want these people who are 
almost undoubtedly going to be experiencing some hardships in the early years to tell a whole lot of people in England about how bad it is and discourage more people from signing on and coming over. And of course, that ends up becoming very important for the survival of the Virginia Company and the colony here in Virginia because things get really bad here at various points. So you're not going to let people go back to England before their contractual obligation is up unless they've got a specific uh, permission from the, the president and council. And they're going to edit the mail, basically. They're going to, to restrict what can be sent back in written word as well. So again, a lot of forethought, a lot of realistic expectations, a really thorough plan. And when you couple this sort of, of, of original documentation, which gives us insight into their thoughts, with the list of people that they send along. A lot of the men that are in charge of this expedition are household names at the time and are about the best, most experienced individuals for something like this that they could have found in the time period. It really makes it clear these guys had a serious and well thought out plan for this expedition. And I think that's an important context for us to understand and truly appreciate the early story at Jamestown. It's so easy to say, I had no idea what they were doing, and that's why things struggled so much. They really had a plan, a very solid, well-thought-out plan. They had a lot of experienced individuals, and they still struggled mightily. And that, I think, really goes a long way to saying just how challenging something like this is and really helps us to appreciate all the more the, the, the true, the full story of, of early colonial. Well, again, thanks for tuning in today. That concludes this episode. Uh, I'd like to thank you for joining us. Please like and subscribe below. Again, check out our links to our other social media, Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Um, and yeah, again, if you, if, you liked, uh, if you liked this episode, this discussion, uh, please let us know. And if you're interested in original source documentation yourself, the document that this episode and the last episode were based on uh, are taken from... The Jamestown Narratives, uh, edited by Edward Wright Hale, uh, this is a collection of nothing but first-hand documentation uh, from the first 10 years of the colony. You can see pretty substantial volume there. Um, it's available uh, in our online gift shop. Again, check the link below. If you've got an interest in first-hand documentation like we do, this is a fantastic resource. Again, thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.